Hello and welcome to all of you. Today I would like to start with a question that seems impossible to answer. The question is, can we predict the likelihood of crimes? I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks. Of course, we immediately see the problems with this question. First, we want to avoid the determinism of theorists like Lombroso who argued that criminality was a biological trait. Second, crimes may include an enormous amount of illegal activities, all very different in scale and gravity. It's not the same thing to blackmail your neighbor, to commit tax evasion, and to commit a mass murder. Except for one thing. All these activities involve deviant behaviors, which means individuals that violate social norms. So we can actually try to answer this question by rephrasing it slightly. We are looking for a common denominator to all deviant behaviors. In a famous article from 1938 titled Social Structure and Anomy, sociologist Robert Merton tried to identify this common denominator of deviant behaviors. He came up with an efficient framework for sociologists and criminologists known as the strain theory. All right, so if such a thing as a common denominator between all deviant behaviors existed, it should include two things. First, a personal component, the individual experiences that make the difference and explain why we're not all criminals. Serial killers Ted Bundy and Christine Joanne Denny allegedly had a rather normal childhood. And two, a structural component, basically how society shapes the behaviors of individuals. This explains, for instance, why there are large geographic variations in crime rates. In the US, for instance, the FBI data shows big differences from state to state and city to city. You can see here the contrast between states like Alaska and New Mexico and states like Maine, New Hampshire and Vermont. The strain theory looks at how social structures within society may pressure citizens to commit crime. The strain applies to goals and means, and it applies to everyone. If you want to be a doctor, you need to get a PhD or MD. If you want to be an attorney, you need to pass the bar, whether you come from a rich family or not. For the little story, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the son of an immensely rich man, failed the New York bar exam twice before he passed on his third try. You may remember that the powerful German Minister of Defense, Karl Theodor Zugutenberg, had to resign after people discovered plagiarism in his doctoral dissertation. Whether you are powerful or rich does not take you away from the strain. However, and there is a huge however, people are not equal in their capacity to access the goals and means of society. Kennedy could afford to fail the bar exam twice, not all students can. Now, how do people deal with the strain? How do they adapt to this? Well, the most common behavior is called conformity. People accept the goals that society has set for them through the socially acceptable means. You want to be a rich engineer or lawyer? Go to university and get this diploma. This is that what you build isn't good for its own sake, but rather good for the society that it's meant to impact. Now, the second way of adapting is called innovation. In innovation, you accept the goals of society, but you refuse the means that society provides for it. A typical example is the profit-motivated criminal. Another very famous example could be the legendary imposter Frank Abagnell, portrayed in Spielberg's movie Catch Me If You Can. He impersonated a teacher, a physician, an attorney, and even an airline pilot looking for social recognition through deviant means. Clearly, here the person violates the law not because he does not believe in it, but because he does not see any other way to reach the social goals that he has set for himself. Closer to us, this is also the case of a middle-class shop owner who engages in money laundering to support his middle-class lifestyle. Then you have ritualism. So these people are not criminals. They have a legitimate way to make a living, they are law-abiding, but they do not believe in the goals that society has set for them, like wealth, like success, etc. In David Fincher's popular movie Fight Club, the main character is at the beginning a typical ritualist person. He has a job, he is law-abiding, but he is deprived of any desire and any life goal. I'd flip through catalogs and wonder, what kind of dining set defines me as a person? This is your life, and it's ending one minute at a time. Retreatism is a step further. Those are the individuals that have rejected the goals of society and the means of it. 
A good example could be the bit and counterculture generation immortalized by Jack Kerouac in On the Road. Closer to us, Christopher McCandless, that you may know from Sean Penn's movie Into the Wild, disappeared after his graduation in 1990. He had abandoned his name, all his possessions, all his savings to wander across North America and live a transcendent experience. His family had lost sight of him until he was eventually found dead in Alaska by hunters. So these individuals have in common to reject the conforming goals and lifestyle of their parents and the larger society. The last category is probably the most radical. Rebellion. Those are the individuals who do not play by the rule and do not want to adapt to the goals of society, but want to change them instead. So typically, these are so-called revolutionary groups. Let's have a look at a speech from Ernesto Che Guevara. In historia tragica de ese mártir de la revolución del mundo que no se puede confiar en el imperialismo, pero ni tantico nada. This pattern is also followed by terrorist groups. For instance, this is how Bin Laden justifies the 9-11 attacks. The common point between these individuals is that they try to emancipate themselves from the reigning standards, whether they come from frustration or from marginalist perspectives, and they try to do so by establishing a new social order. So coming back to our initial question, can we predict the likelihood of crimes? This framework can provide us with important insights. For instance, poverty is not enough to induce a high rate of criminal behaviors. Poverty may lead to deviance if it is associated with concrete disadvantages in the competition for goals and means, and if money is culturally recognized as a symbol of success. All right, so now three important observations can be made. First, these categories should not be seen as hermetic to each other, but rather as a framework that helps us locate where the deviance may happen. This framework has been used to describe the profile of young radicals, like the Kwashi brothers who committed the attack against Charlie Hebdo. The Kwashi brothers adhered to a Western lifestyle and committed petty crimes before they radicalized under the influence of individuals like Farid Benyatou and joined the jihadist cell of Bichamon. It's led them to eventually reject the Western society altogether and to become terrorists. Two, being deviant does not always mean being illegitimate. Why? Because norms and values can evolve over time. A fascinating example can be found in former British India. The Criminal Tribes Act of 1871 notified entire communities as criminal tribes. Their members had to register at the local police station and their movements were limited. In Durkheim's words, an act is criminal when it offends strong and defined states of a collective consciousness. And three, the theory was constructively revisited and criticized by many scholars, including Albert Cohen in Delinquent Boys and Robert Agnew, who tried to propose a general strain theory. The general strain theory includes not only the inability to reach a desired goal, but also the presentation of negative stimuli or the loss of positive stimuli. For instance, that explains why a student can assault his bully to end harassment or why people can take illegal drugs to feel better. But this could be the subject of another video. Voila, I hope that you found this brief introduction to the strain theory useful. If you would like to see more videos like this one, you can hit the notification bell. Thank you very much for your attention and see you next time.